Welcome to First Look, Washington Post Live's one-stop shop for news and analysis. I'm Leanne Caldwell, co-author of the Early 202 newsletter and anchor at Washington Post Live. I'm filling in for Jonathan Capehart this morning. We're going to begin with Caroline Kitchener, a national reporter covering abortion for the Washington Post. Caroline, thanks for joining First Look. Thanks for having me, Leanne. Caroline, you're here the perfect week, um, but almost every week is the perfect week to talk about abortion and abortion politics and abortion fallout after Roe v. Wade. Big news in Arizona this week when the state Supreme Court essentially banned abortion in this state. Can you talk about the court's reasoning for that and what the uh, when it will go into effect? The court essentially said that now that Roe v. Wade is no longer the law of the land, um, it's not, it's sort of out of their hands to do anything. And they said it should be up to the legislators and to ballot initiatives um, to decide what is going to happen with this law. So, um, you know, that, that really leads into the fact that it does look like in November, there will be an opportunity for people in Arizona to vote on whether or not they want a protected right to abortion in their state constitution. So the court pointed to a law from 1864, before Arizona was even a state, it was a territory, it was an anti-abortion law with a or I'm sorry, anti-slavery law with an anti-abortion provision in it. Can you talk about why the Supreme Court said that a law from before Arizona was even a state can be go into effect? Well, before the Dobbs decision, almost two years ago, there were a couple of these states that still had these laws on the books. And one of the big questions when Dobbs happened was what is going to happen with these laws? Um, so there was one in Texas, there was one in Wisconsin that until very recently was in effect as well, and there was one in Arizona. And what happened, um, you know, as soon as the decision came down, those laws essentially took effect because providers, I mean, it really was up to the providers, you know, do we feel safe providing abortions when this law is on the books? And, you know, they, they didn't because this law is on the books and, and, and you know, technically, you know, abortion was illegal. So we, we did see that, you know, these exact kind of laws prevent abortions from happening in Wisconsin for over a year. Um, and in, in this particular law actually did take effect in Arizona. Um, and it was, you know, in effect um, for a little while after the Dobbs decision. Um, and now it is back. Hmm. So we have Arizona this week. We had Florida last week where that state Supreme Court said that a six week ban would go into effect on May 1st. But also there like Arizona, there could be a ballot initiative for voters to vote on in, in November. Can you talk about the implications for women, for families, for people living in Florida, one of the most populous states, and Arizona state in the Southwest where abortion is no longer legal? What I really can't emphasize enough is how big these numbers are that we're talking about. Florida, um, last year, there were 84,000 abortions that happened in the state of Florida. Um, just to kind of put that into context, to date, the largest state that has enacted an abortion ban was Texas, and they had 50,000 a year before that ban took effect. So this is just sort of orders of magnitude larger than than what we've seen, and and it's it's in addition to all of these other bans that are already in effect. So what you're going to have happening is, you know, people from Florida, the closest clinics for them are going to be in North Carolina, in Illinois, in Virginia, in Maryland. Those clinics are already seeing a lot more traffic than they were. They're already sort of many of them are struggling to meet demand. So the question is, you know, those 84,000 women, this is not a total ban, but, you know, most abortions do happen after the six week mark. Um, and that's a six week ban in Florida. The question is, you know, where are all of those Florida women going to go? And, and, and I think, you know, that's a really hard question for providers to answer right now. Um, I want to move a little bit to the politics of this. We had Donald Trump who came out this week, uh, the day before this Arizona Supreme Court decision saying, 
let's leave it to the states. Of course, this is a position, it's not a new position. This is what Republicans have been saying um, since before Roe v. Wade was overturned. Um, and it's really avoiding the issue. And then he came out after the Arizona decision and said, oh, wait, 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 Those, the state went too far. Um, can you talk about Donald Trump's, um, you know, influence in the party and in politics on this issue and what sort of implications you think, who covers this so deeply and talks to voters and women around the country, what sort of implications it would have in November? Well, I think, you know, I, I, I think the Trump campaign clearly is scrambling to figure out what to do and what to say um, on this issue for months and months and months. I know that the anti-abortion advocates that I talked to have been lobbying his team, um, really trying to get him to come out, many of them in favor of some kind of national abortion ban. Um, you know, but on the other hand, you also have um, have folks that say, no, you know, we don't want the 15 week ban. We want him to be, you know, even harsher than that. Um, but I think the, the thing that I really want people to know about the landscape with Trump and abortion right now is that, you know, he has come out saying, pledging now on Wednesday that he will not sign a national abortion ban. That does not mean that he will not take, his administration will not take drastic measures to restrict abortion across the country. There are many things that his administration could do day one, day five, day 10, day 20, um, you know, by, by um, the, the, there, are, there are certain agency actions that they could take to really, really cut down on access, to prohibit the mailing of any materials related to abortion. Um, that's the Comstock Act. Um, this sort of long dormant 1800s law um, th that people I think are finally starting to talk about um, because the Supreme Court justices, a few of them recently spoke about it in a recent case. And, and that law, if, you know, that law is still on the books and the Biden administration has said, you know what, we're not going to enforce it, but, but Donald Trump definitely could. Um, so, so that's something to watch. So fascinating, such a great point, Caroline. And to that, um, the Biden campaign is really, uh, you know, uh, homing in on this issue. Um, we saw one, two, I guess three really powerful ads in the past two weeks on abortion. Um, Vice President Kamala Harris is in Arizona today. Um, you know, are you seeing anything from their messaging and their focus on the issue? Um, or is there anything else that you they could do to protect abortion for women across this country? I think, you know, that is, it's a very good question. I think there are, you know, a lot of abortion rights activists out there who really feel like, you know, they haven't done enough and it's a lot of posturing. And, you know, I, I know that there is sort of frustration with, you know, taking this moment and going into Arizona and, um, you know, um, among some abortion rights activists who really feel that they could do more right now um, for access. Um, but I think we're going to just continue to see this, you know, heading into November. I think this week really made clear that this is, you know, one of the most important issues, if not the most important issue. And I think, you know, the big question is going to be whether Biden can be an effective messenger for it. Um, so you talked about abortion pills, the Comstock Act. Uh, you had a, such a powerful piece in the Post yesterday um, about women in these states where abortion is banned who are using these pills. Um, they're ordering them um, and they're afraid to seek medical guidance. They're doing it alone. Can you talk a little bit about that story and some of the things that you heard reporting that story um, as women are facing uh, lots of fear about abortion, about seeking care, about asking for advice, and even about taking pills that they don't even know are safe? Well, what we have seen happen is that, you know, it's it's impossible for a lot of people to leave the state and to get care at a clinic. And so what we have seen happen is just thousands and thousands of women in these states with bans ordering pills online, getting them through sort of these um, grassroots networks that are springing up and um, and taking them that way. And, 
you know, for some that is a very straightforward process, um, but for others, it can be very difficult and extremely isolating because they get these pills and, you know, typically you would have a conversation with a doctor beforehand who would tell you kind of what to expect, who would give you a number to call during the process. So, you know, while you are experiencing these symptoms, which sometimes can be really difficult, really heavy bleeding, cramping, um, you know, it's essentially a miscarriage. Um, they give you a number to say, you know, you, you, you can call us with questions. Um, these women who are taking them in states with bans really don't have that option. Um, it is hard to know where to turn and who to call, and it can be extremely scary. And, you know, every woman that I spoke to for the story said, you know, I, I didn't feel like I could go to the emergency room, you know, when I wasn't sure if everything was okay, because I felt like I would be prosecuted. Um, and, you know, it, that, that's just an extremely difficult situation for people to be in. Yeah. And I want to clarify what I said in my question that they don't know if the pills are safe, the abortion pills are safe, but when you don't talk to anyone, get any sort of advice and you just order them in the mail, there's fear there that you might be getting something that is not what you think you're supposed to be getting. So just want to well, clarify exactly. that. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, the, the, the issue is that, you know, when you're in a state where it's legal and, you know, you, you kind of Google around online and, and you, you know, find recommendations for these websites, but it's still, you know, it all feels a little sketchy because you know that it's illegal. And so you don't know, like, is this, everyone just kept saying to me, is this legit? Like, you know, did, or like, I, I just didn't know if it was legit or not, you know? And I, I think that's a very, um, I think that's a very relatable and understandable feeling. Yeah, totally. It's like, yeah. I buying eclipse glasses online. You don't know if they're real or, you know, when you don't know and no one you can ask. Um, my last question, Caroline, is it's every single week there seems to be, I'm exaggerating, but often there's another kind of shoe that drops uh, in the aftermath of the Dobbs decision um, in states across the country. What are you looking for next? What is, what, you know, what should we expect? What court case should we be looking out for? What states, et cetera? I, I don't, I, I, knock on wood, I don't think that there's going to be, you know, in the near term, any other, um, you know, really major state court case in the way that, you know, we've seen Florida and Arizona. Um, but the, the next big thing is the, there is going to be another abortion case before the Supreme Court. Um, and that revolves around this um, federal emergency care law called EMTALA, um, which has really been a, um, a, a, a strategy of the Biden administration. They have sort of co-opted this law and said, um, you know, under this law, you know, hospitals must care for people in these emergency situations, including providing abortions in states with bans. So they have kind of made this, you know, a, a really big um, part of their effort um, to, to, you know, to telling people, you know, this is what we're doing in response to the bans. We are going to compel hospitals to act in these situations. Um, so the Supreme Court is going to be um, hearing a case about, you know, whether that really does fall under EMTALA um, and, you know, whether, you know, the Biden administration can, um, can kind of enforce it in that way. Hmm. Great. Caroline, we have to leave it there. We're out of time. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thanks for having me. And now we move to the second part of our program with our opinions columnist. Let me welcome in contributing columnist Hugh Hewitt and associate editor and columnist Ruth Marcus. Thank you both for joining First Look. Hi there. Uh, so, Hugh, let's start with you and stick with the issue of abortion. Um, we know, we all know that abortion has become a very complicated issue for Republicans politically. What are you seeing? Are, do you think that this uh, the issue is being overblown as far as its political impacts for Republicans, or do you think that Republicans should be nervous? Uh, I think a, a number of things, Leanne, and good morning to you and to Ruth. <laughs> I've been teaching the abortion cases for 30 years to law students. It takes three hours to do a cursory review of everything from Roe to Dobbs to Stenberg to uh, Gonzalez, and it's a uh, for 30, for 50 years, the Supreme Court took over abortion law, and then they gave it back to the states in time. What we learned in May of last year from Gallup is that two-thirds of Americans believe that there should be some restrictions on abortion, 
one third of Americans believe no abortion, and that's going to take some time for the return of the legislative duty to the legislatures to figure out. Uh, I've read Justice Lopez. I know Justice Lopez. I should disclose that. I, I've read his opinion. I'm persuaded by it. The statutory schemes were all contingent. And I'll turn it over to Ruth at this point, but I do think Republicans, state by state, is the right way in the same way that European states differ, American states differ in their public opinion polls and what they believe about uh, pro-life, pro-abortion rights. And it's going to take a while for those 50 states to render their decision. Uh, I just want to follow up really quickly, but what about those states where the abortion is banned and uh, voters aren't happy about it, and Donald Trump says states like Arizona went too far? Well, every state's got to make a choice, and every Republican in every legislature, as every do a Democrat does, has to make a choice about what they are in favor of or against. I agree and have always held the position it ought not to be a national standard. It ought to be a state-by-state -state decision. Because I've been in Pennsylvania, Michigan, California, D.C., Virginia in the last month. They're all very different places. The United States is a very big place. There is no constitutional right for abortion. That's a job decision. It will take a while. But I think we're going to end up with every state at least permitting early stage abortion and very few saying no abortion ever. I don't think anyone will say that. Ruth, the Biden campaign is continuing to make this a key issue in, in Biden's re-election. Um, they've come out with three very powerful ads in the past two weeks. Um, just on this, Vice President Kamala Harris is in Arizona today. Do you think that this is going to be as galvanizing of an issue as it was in 2022 um, at the presidential level? I think it could, and I think that's in part thanks to state Supreme Courts in red states, red states like Arizona, which we've just seen, in Florida, which effectively uh, allowed the six-week ban to go forward, in uh, Alabama, where we saw that, um, sorry, wackadoodle IVF decision. Um, and so these state Supreme Courts, and this goes to Hugh's point that, uh, Hugh's argument that it makes sense to leave this to state voters. Yes, but um, Republicans need to be careful about what they've wished for. This is the real lesson of everything that's happened to the Republican Party on abortion since Dobbs was decided, because Republican Party and activists, legal activists, spent years creating conservative state Supreme Courts, and now they are coming up with decisions that are agitating um, not just Democratic voters, but Republican voters in those states because, um, and, under, and perhaps using state constitutions to impose things like fetal personhood that would prevent state voters from really deciding what abortion rights they think people in their states should have. Mm -hmm. Ruth, you had a column this week where you wrote, and I'm gonna quote, read it, uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with Donald Trump's newly announced position on abortion except for the obvious and provable fact that he doesn't mean it. Why do you think that? Well, it actually goes to um, something that Carolyn was saying earlier, which is, well, look, what is bet In my world, in the Ruthiverse, um, it would be better if women had the same rights across the country and had rights to abortion that existed for 50 years before Dobbs unfortunately took them away. Uh, in the absence of that, is it better to have state by state decisions than a national ban, which would um, be really misleading um, because it doesn't mean you would get to have abortions up to 16 weeks as the anti-abortion groups want it. The national ban means that any state could be as draconian as Arizona or as South Dakota and prohibit abortion except to save the mother's life, but that no state could go beyond 16 weeks. So in that sense, state by state is better than the alternative. But the problem for, pre for a future um, President Trump is that he doesn't really mean it in this sense. What would the Trump administration do to enforce or not enforce the Comstock Act? Um, would it take the position of the Biden administration and say that law uh, doesn't apply in this circumstance, or would he use it to stop abortion pills or other um, 
tools to perform abortions from being sent through the mail or otherwise delivered, number one. Number two, would he withdraw or change the FDA approval of mifepristone, which now accounts for close to two thirds of abortions that are performed? He could do, the Trump administration could withdraw that on day one. So anybody who listens to Donald Trump say he wants to leave this to states needs to follow up by asking him, what would you do on these two things? And Hugh, last question on abortion. Uh, I spend lots of time talking to Republicans on Capitol Hill, Republican campaign operatives as well. Um, and they say that now this is back with the states where it should be so that the people can decide um, and pe uh, the freedom to make their own choice of what the state law should be. What about the counter argument to that, that the freedom should actually be allowing a woman to make a choice with, uh, about what they want to do without any sort of government intervention. Yeah, well, Leanne, I get that question a lot from law students, and I always answer it this way. This is a legal issue, not an ethical issue as a journalist. The law here was distorted by the court in 1973, was restored to what it ought to have been in 2022. And what we will see come through this process is a balancing of interests, which legislatures are uniquely capable of doing. And I believe they ought to do it because New York is very, very different from Ohio, which is very, very different from Kansas, which both had overturned, uh, initiatives had overturning restrictive abortion laws. We will get to, we will settle over the course of 10 years, but it's an abject lesson in why courts ought not to legislate because what they stopped in 73 was the gradual evolution of abortion and reproductive rights laws in the United States. And I wish that had happened for 50 years, but we are starting it now. Hmm. So, Leanne, she, may I? Yeah, of course. A, a one sentence dissent. Women in New York, women in Texas should not have different rights to decide what to do with their own bodies than women in New York, period. That's what we had under Roe, and that's unfortunately um, where the law isn't anymore. Thank you both on that. I know this is like a very, very serious and solemn discussion with many, many political implications. I uh, do want to turn to Israel. Uh, Ruth, yesterday the Israeli Defense Ministry announced they were constructing a new crossing uh, from Israel for humanitarian aid. Do you think that this is window dressing or do you think that it will have any sort of beneficial impacts to the people in Gaza? Uh, I don't think it's window dressing. Um, it can't, getting um, humanitarian supplies, food, water, medical supplies, other things to people in Gaza is essential. Uh, a, there are issues about getting that aid once Israel allows it through, deliver it on the other end. So I don't think it's window dressing. I do think it is terribly too late. And I think that Israel made a very um, unstrategic, unwise, and unhumanitarian decision to cut off aid and not allow enough aid through and to not facilitate aid early in the war, and it's taken it taken Israel way too long to recognize the problem that it was creating, both the humanitarian problem on the ground in Gaza and as a more strategic uh, imperative, the problems that is causing the country and will cause the country in the future in terms of garnering public support. So I'm very, very glad to see this change. I just wish it hadn't happened at the start and that Israel had changed course more quickly and sooner. Mm -hmm. um, you, you recently wrote that Israel needs to go into the city of Rafa, which uh, Benjamin Netanyahu said that it would still do um, to finish off Hamas. I want to ask you, um, do you think, you think that this will, will be effective in finishing on, off Hamas? But I want to ask in this context, it has been, I don't even know if it's ever happened that a country has been able to effectively dismantle a terrorist organization, especially without spreading, uh, you know, internal support for that organization. How 
is Israel going to meet its set objective when completely eliminating a terrorist network is seems quite impossible, especially well, when there are public opinion there are 5, polls. 5,000 killers yeah. in Rafa right now. 5,000 Hamas terrorists are holed up in Rafa. Four to five battalions of terrorists are in Rafa. You can't let those people have territory. You can't let those killers have weapons. And you cannot let them escape from the country unless it's pursuant to a negotiated resolution that frees however many hostages are still alive. Israel cannot allow terrorists to live like the Hamas murderers are living within shouting distance of Israel. You can destroy as the ISIS caliphate was destroyed in Mosul, but it didn't destroy ISIS. There's now ISIS-K, there's isis al there's ISIS in the Philippines, there's ISIS in Malaysia. You can't kill off an ideology. There's still Nazis around, for goodness sake. But you can deny them territory from which they can organize, operate, and strike. And that's what Israel has done and will finish doing. And I expect if Iran strikes uh, Israel today, as is expected today or tomorrow, that's what I keep my eye on the Times of Israel to see if it's happened, Iran will pay a price and Hezbollah will pay a price. And and free states have to defend themselves, Leanne. And I, I defer to... Uh, uh, Ruth, who's been more recently in Israel than I have, but the Israelis support going into Rafah, nine out of 10. This is not a question for the Israelis who are on the front line, and I don't think we should make it an American question. Great. Ruth, you, as you said, you were just in Israel. Um, can you talk about what, what you gleaned from being there? Oh, um I was in Israel and a few for about a week, um, which I guess makes me an expert. It, it doesn't, but but it was a very powerful and profound visit. We were down at one of the kibbutzes that was overrun by terrorists. We were at the scene of the music festival and you know, looking at the hazy skyline of, of Gaza in the not very far distance. And it gives you a sense of the vulnerability of the country and the reason, as Hugh says, that um, the, the citizenry seems very um, supportive of the idea of finishing the job, as they say in Rafa. One of the things that was extremely striking to me um, was the degree to which Israelis feel not just vulnerable, but isolated. Um, a soldier that I talked to, a U.S.-born soldier, older soldier, talked about it as the existential loneliness of Israel. And for the first time in my visits there, people were, Israelis, including soldiers, were thanking us for coming um, and visiting mm -hmm. because they do feel um, isolated and highly criticized by the world. And from their point of view, they were the victims of this terrible atrocity, and they were victims of this terrible atrocity on October 7th. And for various reasons, including, as I said, um, some of Israel's own creation, some because of pre-existing hostility towards Israel, some because of a double standard to which I believe Israel is held. They have found themselves close to becoming an international pariah in defending themselves against this horrific attack. So yeah. it was really a quite amazing visit. And what, one last thing is the degree to which Israelis are braced for an even greater and potentially more dangerous war in the north with Hezbollah. Um, we only have about two minutes left, and I want to ask you both about O.J. Simpson, um, a big defining moment in our time. Uh, Hugh, you were uh, commentating on PBS as the white Bronco was driving down that freeway in Los Angeles. Um, I think all of us who were alive remember where they, we were during that moment. Can you talk about how this trial and this in, and this situation uh, changed the United States? It did. For 30 years ago, I was doing live television at night with Pat Morrison, Kermit Maddox, and Ruben Martinez, and we happened to go long, and we stayed live through the Bronco chase, which lasted about two hours. Roughly congruent, they found him about six. They caught him about nine. He was in Irvine, where I used to live. He was driving around. It was a crazy thing. It changed the coverage of car chases, small matter. And it changed the, the perception of the justice system, big matter. And Dominic Dunn is a novelist. Another City Not My Own is a book about O.J. Simpson and everything that went on. I will leave it to Ruth to say what she thought. But in California, it was a wild experience. It changed the news business in California. And it changed yeah. how people view this. Um, Ruth, 
And 10 seconds, what was the, what is like the defining thing about the OJ Simpson trial for you in this country? The gap, the racial gap in perceptions between white viewers of this event and of the trial and black viewers, it really drew that home for me, along with the importance actually of televising trials as we get ready for the Trump trial. I'm sorry, we're not going to get a chance to see that. That's such a great point. Uh, we are out of time. Ruth, Hugh, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, Leanne. Thanks. See you guys. Yeah, and for more of these important conversations, sign up for Washington Post subscription and get a free trial by visiting WashingtonPost.com slash live. That's WashingtonPost.com slash live. I'm Leanne Caldwell. Thanks so much for joining. See you soon.